Good luck editing this one. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how you're going to turn this into a coherent segment. Don't worry, I'll do it. <laughs> You'll just have, like, top, bottom, and then everything else cut out. User error 73. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. And I'm Dan. And we're back. And a little plug for extras.show. Jupiter Extras, the new show on the network, which is its kind of not really a show. It's more of a feed of just random stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. There's some cool interviews in there and kind of longer versions of stuff. So uh, do check it out, extras.show. But for this one, then, we're going to do another hashtag Ask Error special. And remember, you can use that hashtag Ask Error on Twitter, or you can email us, error.show slash contact, or in the Jupiter Broadcasting Telegram group. So the first question then, top bunk or bottom bunk? Is this a euphemism or are you actually talking about bunk beds? Bunk beds. If you have to uh, be in a situation where you're in bunk beds, which one do you go for? Either way, top bunk. (laughs) 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 Took me a while. We're not getting into euphemisms, okay? Uh, Why the top then, if you're talking about actual beds? I don't know. There's just something weird about being on the bottom bunk and it's all squeaky and it's it's sinking above you and it's claustrophobic and I don't like it. And what if they pee? I mean, this is bunk beds, so we're at like camp or something, right? We're children and you don't know if that person's fully potty trained. They might pee on you while you're asleep. (laughs) I would rather be the peer, not the peed on. (laughs) I don't want any peeing to go on at all. I, I, I think I would rather have the bottom bunk. Uh, because, uh, I don't know why it is, but I really like having the wall next to me. So when I was first, um, dating Claire, uh, my, she used to come over to my place and I had a double bed in my room and it was up against one wall rather than being in the middle of the room. And we used to fight to get the wall. And if one of us went to the loo, by the time we come back into the bed, the other one would have shuffled up and would be flat up against the wall and the other person wouldn't get a look in. So I, I quite like having the wall. I quite like that claustrophobic feeling of being like held in. I like tight blankets and, um, you know, having a really thick, heavy duvet, uh, not a comforter. And, and I like being up against the wall, like flat, like face up against the wall. I really like that. And so um, I feel like you get that from bottom bunk. Well, I'm a bit of both, really. I would like the top bunk if I possibly could. However, practicality means that I basically can't because I'm so enormous and I'm just worried it'll break. So, yeah, I have to reluctantly bottom bunk. How would the distro landscape change if Ubuntu didn't allow other distros to use their infrastructure and repos? This one's a little bit close to home for you two. I think for some of the more established Ubuntu-based distros, that it probably wouldn't change that much. I, I think that for like a team our size that we're already kind of moving away from using a lot of the canonical infrastructure, So it would just kind of accelerate that change. But for some of the more experimental, smaller distros, uh, that could probably be really devastating to them. I I don't know. It would probably have a lot of of effect on on little uh, pet projects. Which would be a good thing, as far as you're concerned, Popey, probably. (laughs) Well, so you've got to think about what, what circumstance would direct this happening, right? So I don't know. Canonical just shuts down because of whatever reason. Uh, there was an Ubuntu Foundation set up to keep things moving while Canonical shuts down. So in theory, those projects that use the Canonical infrastructure would have some time to migrate off to something else. I, I doubt it would be a you know sudden switch off. But in this hypothetical example where things have gone you know to the point where you no longer have access to Launchpad, so you can't build anything and you no longer have access to the repository so you can't host anything, that would be a bit of a problem for some people. And I, I, But I I imagine they would just rebase off Debian. If if they're really um, hooked on the the Deb model, then they could just switch to using Debian instead. They could rebuild the archive and host it themselves. That's actually not that hard uh, to rebuild the entire archive and host it yourself. It's just 
money that you'd have to spend on hosting and on build machines. For us, Canonical, we have build machines that build AMD 64, i386, 32-bit, 64-bit ARM, PowerPC, and S390. But if you're a distro that only has one architecture, like maybe you only target the Raspberry Pi, or maybe you only target AMD 64, then that's less of a problem for you. So, you know, less space for hosting, minimal build requirements. I don't know. I don't think it would be a major catastrophe. Some of the smaller distros might give up because it's too much work. But I think some of the larger ones would just switch to Debian. Yeah, I think in our case that there's two routes to look at that are the most obvious ones. And one of them, maybe less intuitively, is using a Fedora base because the uh, Fedora community has been doing a really awesome job on getting Pantheon running on Fedora. Um, So I think that's something that we'd seriously look at. And another one is just moving to more of a completely container-based approach with OS tree and, and Flatpak and and doing something completely different and, and not trying. I think either way we went that it would give us an opportunity to reinvent and it wouldn't be such a like, let's keep everything exactly the same as it was as close as possible. I'd be like, okay, like clean slate, you know, what would we do if we didn't have anything before anyway if we were starting over anyway where would we go i think the bigger problem is what people underestimate is the amount of engineering work that goes on inside canonical so it's not just a case of the build machines and the hosting there's also a team of people who are doing security updates for all those packages that are in the main archive and some that are in universe and there's kernel engineering that gets done and that is a ton of people doing an awful lot of work and if that all goes away then what do all these distros do about updates to their existing users? You know, are those users going to be uh, orphaned off and, you know, they're going to have to reinstall on some new base or are you going to have to very quickly spin up an archive and then just have best endeavors? I think people underestimate how much work goes on to make Ubuntu and looking at it just as, oh, well, there's this archive I can use really downplays the amount of work that Canonical does to make that archive work. And so it is a lot of work beyond just rebuilding and hosting. I think that when people envisage this, they're not really thinking about Canonical just disappearing and Ubuntu going away. They're thinking more Canonical gets bought and whoever buys them wants to kind of tighten up things. And so the distro would still be there and the source code would be there. So it would... It, well, in, in my vision, the, it would be fairly straightforward, but expensive, as you say. I don't know exactly how expensive. I mean, do you two have any idea? Let's say you just wanted to build AMD 64 and then host it. Are we talking hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands? Monetarily? Yeah, per month. Oh, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, you can look at the size of the archive. It's not tremendously huge. It's it's not terabytes of storage. It's, you know, 100 gigabytes or something like that. Um, maybe less for any one architecture in the source code. And you need a few AMD 64 machines to build it on, um, which, you know, you could rent from the cloud or get sponsorship from someone. You probably find some um, kind hearted person might even donate build infrastructure. But again, that only solves part of the problem. There's still all the engineering work that has to be done to keep it all running what happens when something fails to build like what if gcc fails to build or what if there's a severe update uh, to the kernel severe security update in the kernel who manages that who looks after that who who patches the kernel who brings down the patches from like the next version of the kernel and backports them to all the previous releases who's going to do that work so it's not just about money and hosting and building it's resources to have developers who actually work on this stuff If we're only interested in the cost of like building and hosting, which like Alan said, is not the bulk of the value that we get from the Ubuntu archive. And I don't know if this is like what capacity of our infrastructure that we're currently using or if we're we're paying more than what we're using. But um, for just the App Center repo, which... Um, at the moment, I think has a little bit over 150 packages in it, which is not a very large number of packages at all compared to the Ubuntu archive. Um, we're doing a little over $50 a month just to pay for that, just for our users. 
So I, I could imagine that trying to mirror the entire archive and for every possible distro that's based on that archive, it would be very, very expensive. I would love to know how much Canonical spends on that because at some point, there must be that calculation done by them. And it must be like, well, is it worth the bad PR of not allowing that anymore? And obviously the answer right now is it's not worth the bad PR. But if it were bought by Microsoft or whoever, then maybe that would change. I don't know. So what you're saying is, do we look at the numbers and say, you know, this particular distro looks like it's consuming a certain amount of the launchpad build farm and it's consuming this amount of the archive not as far as i'm aware but the elephant in the room is the ubuntu users dwarf all the other distros yeah so none of the, none of the other distros actually make a blip on the use of the archive as far as i'm aware or the use of launchpad that doesn't mean that some distro might come along and you know usurp us and suddenly become more popular and you know might do things better than we do and you know, get mind share and become more popular. That could happen for sure. Um, and I agree with you. It probably doesn't make sense for us to um, request that those those distros, you know, pay a fee. But you know, when you take a step back, Canonical is paying that fee. Canonical pays for all the machines that are building. And you could just go to launchpad.net slash builders, and you can see how many machines there are that build everything. And you can see them building and what they're building. And the archive, which is hosted at Canonical, but there are mirrors all around the world. And we're very grateful that there are universities and other establishments that mirror everything. But there's also a CDN in front of that. So on launch day, the ISOs are super popular, especially LTS launch day. And so someone has to pay for that. And right now that's Canonical. Um, it would be nice if the other distros donated something towards that, but I'm not sure it would really make a dent. And I'm not sure it would be super useful to do that. They're probably better off spending that money on innovating in their own way rather than, you know, paying us to move bits around the internet, I think. So you're saying that it's pretty unlikely then? Well, I don't know. It's not, it's way above my pay grade. And I can't imagine, I mean, all things are possible in the future because I'm not a soothsayer and I don't have a crystal ball, but I can't imagine a scenario where someone would, shut down the archive and say this is only for Ubuntu users because it wouldn't do us or anyone else or the open source community any good because people build on Ubuntu and make innovative new things like elementary, like System76, like Linux Mint. These people have all built on what we've done and made something which in some people's eyes is better. And so we would be shutting that down and that doesn't seem like a, a good open source citizen thing to do. I think this kind of plays into a larger conversation about using platforms that are open so that your data is portable because we never know if things are going to go away, even if it doesn't seem like that's possible in the near future. But as long as we have the source code and if we want, we can move to some other system or we could um, spin up our own build servers or our own archive or things like that, then it's not so much of a concern. If we're investing in open technologies, then things can be flexible and things can move around. And if something disappears, something else will pop up to take its place. And so it's, I don't think it's a terrible concern as long as we're we're investing in things that are easily re reproducible because they're open source. Right. And when, as an example, when the i386 apocalypse happened a few months ago, I looked into what it would take to rebuild all of Ubuntu, but only for i386. If someone wanted to host, a, you know, a, an i386 archive only if Canonical decided they didn't want to do that. So I wrote a script, it only took me a couple of hours, and I wrote a script which could rebuild the entire Ubuntu archive as i386. But again, that's only part of the story. It's there's you know, getting getting the source code and being able to rebuild it is is a useful thing, but there's all the other things you've got to cope with on top. Are there any things that you are irrationally frugal or tight or stingy with? So irrationally, as in, I don't use much of this despite the fact that there's tons of it, I think is, is where I interpret this question. And for some reason, I'm irrationally stingy with some things in the kitchen, like 
pasta and rice which are ridiculously cheap like it's a few quid for a giant bag of rice but for some reason i'm irrationally stingy with it and i will only use a small amount of it when i'm cooking i don't know why it's it's stupid because you know it's not like i can't just walk down the shop and buy another bag of rice it's not like it's in short supply but for some reason i'm irrationally stingy with things that are really cheap and easily consumed and easily purchased when cooking i don't know why you totally stole mine. I was going to say, <laughs> Karen gets super mad at me when I, I come home from the grocery store and she's like, why didn't you get Captain Crunch? And I was like, that's $3. I paid $2 for sparkly, poofy balls of fruit. Oh, so you're saying you buy non-named brand products. Yeah. Right. Some things, though, I am really weird about. Like, I really need the brand name of like this specific thing because everything else sucks. But if I can get away with it, I'm totally going generic brand on everything that I, I think that there's not really a measur measurable difference. Well, yeah, ketchup has to be Heinz, but uh, beans can be supermarket owned as far as I'm concerned. You're wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> beans means Heinz. And that's, there's no, there's no <laughs> other contender for that crown. They're a bit too salty for my tastes. Ah, okay. Um, I'm not too mad about always having name brands of anything really. Although, I think you asked me a question a little while ago about buying name brand batteries or something. Yeah. Um, I always buy like name brand batteries for some reason, but whatever's cheapest mostly. But the, but for for rice, I don't buy name brand rice, but for some reason I'm super stingy and won't use it all up. I don't know why that is. It's weird that both of you went to the kitchen because that's my one as well. It's kitchen based and it's kitchen roll. For some reason. I'm just so stingy with it. I'll tear off a corner if that's all I need. <laughs> and my wife gets so annoyed with me. She's just like, use a whole slice, as we call it. Piece, I think, is probably the wow. the word for it. A slice, not a square. Yeah. Right. No, we call it a slice of bog roll and a slice of uh, kitchen roll. Okay. <laughs> I know it's the wrong word, but it's just what we call it. So I use too much kitchen roll i'll like pull four or five and then mop something up and if my mother-in-law is here i think it's a generational thing if my mother-in-law is here she'd rather grab a cloth dishcloth rinse it out and then use that to clean the side or clean up any mess she will never go for a, a kitchen roll whereas i i will take food out of the oven and put it on the warmer and then put a, tear off a slice of kitchen roll and put it on top of something so that all the liquid doesn't evaporate away and you know nothing the cats don't get to it or anything but then that i haven't all i do is then throw that away and all it's had is water evaporate into it it's not like dirty or anything you'll be calling it slices now and people will be looking at you funny yeah i will what's the best thing to happen in it since you started using computers now i hope you're a bit older than us so you've probably got a bit more uh, to work with here. <laughs> but Dan, what about you? If anybody says anything other than internet, they're wrong. <laughs> well, when I started using computers, the internet did exist, but it was pretty slow and shit. Like I, uh, well, affordably anyway, you could get like one or two megabits. So that was my go-to as well. Having 350 megabits per second now is pretty sweet. So you're both going for internet? Yeah, it's like super fast internet or whatever. Okay, I'm not going for internet uh so in dan's eyes i'm wrong i'm choosing <laughs> free software oh gotcha so um i would say free software simply because it's an enabler for so many people it doesn't you know whether you've got internet connection or not if someone hands you a cd that's got you know a whole load of free open source software then that enables you to do stuff there's no way you could have done before whether you've got an internet connection or not you can think about someone writing letters in LibreOffice or open office or you can think about someone writing a book or doing design work or you know managing their photo collection or whatever it could be anything creative free software has enabled people to do that especially those who have uh, low income or don't have the means to pay for expensive software have you really been using computers since before 83 then? So my first computer was in 1981, Christmas 1981. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> wow. I was going to say I was negative six at that time, so I don't think I can use that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, Yeah. And, and I remember 
in the early days, uh, shareware was a big thing. And I remember, uh, had a little catalog, um, that you would flick through and it had a list of all the floppy disks that you could order. And at the back, there was an order form and you'd write your, the numbers of all the floppy disks you wanted and add them all up and then put that in an envelope with a check or a postal order and then send it off. And you'd get a little jiffy bag arrive maybe a week later with a pile of floppy disks in. And it was like Christmas every you know few weeks, whenever you want, and you get the new, the new version of the catalog in the jiffy bag as well. And that's where I first got a, Pascal compiler and a C compiler and a whole load of other like utilities and tools and stuff I got on floppy disk. And a lot of that was shareware, but quite a lot of it was actual free software. Um, but that was in the like late eighties, early nineties. And that was quite a revolution really. Okay. If Joe's is internet, I will change mine to the best slash worst thing to ever happen, which is mobile internet. <laughs> Because it totally changed the world, right? Like in a crazy way, like internet at home is one thing, but like mobile internet really, really, really changed things. And I think that it's been a tool that humanity has discovered that had no idea what the power was and did really dangerous things with it. And we're maybe starting to grasp like how powerful this thing is, but uh being able to access the internet from any location, anywhere, and the kinds of tools and products that that has enabled, I think, without that, without this mobile internet experience, I, I don't know if anything else would be as perpetuated throughout society. I think we wouldn't have people so concerned about data privacy or security or anything like that without mobile internet. And I think that people wouldn't care so much about open source software if we didn't have the problems that mobile internet created. Possibly. I think the world would be very different because, well, I don't know, do you consider smartphones and mobile internet to go hand in hand? Because if you do, then smartphones ruined the internet, as far as I'm concerned. I've probably said that on the show before. In some ways, yeah, totally worst thing ever to happen, right? But in some ways, like really drove tons of innovation and made people rethink the way things work. And like the web has probably gotten worse because of smartphones. But I think in general, the way people use the internet in terms of like accessibility of APIs and apps and the way that we communicate with each other and the way that we do commerce, I think that all of that is is become incredibly different in a lot of really positive ways. I see your argument for the positive and negative side of mobile internet. Like I just spent a week in America in a completely different time zone and I could take a little slab out of my pocket, press a couple of buttons and have a video call with my family on the other side of the world. And it was like instant and, you know, HD video quality. Now, obviously there's a lot of infrastructure in between me and them to make that happen, but that meant that I could stay in touch with the family the whole time I was away, whether it meant like answering questions about stuff going on in the house or um, me asking them about stuff while I'm away. Checking they weren't using too much rice. Yes. Uh, but the flip side of that is nobody seems disconnected from anyone ever. So it used to be that I would go to work and while I was at work, I would be disconnected from the family and I would have no communication with the family until I got back through the door at the end of the day. And then I might get welcomed with, you know, a hug and a kiss and a glass of wine because they miss me. And I feel like, I don't think this is unique to my family, but I feel like because we constantly talk to each other on social media and chat apps, we never have the time to really talk to people properly when we see them because everyone knows everything you've done. Everyone knows everything you've seen. You can't tell stories because, oh yeah, I saw you posted that on Facebook or whatever. And I worry that that's detrimental to our relationships outside of the internet. What's your worst habit? You first. Uh, I've got two joint worst habits. One is my excessive drinking uh, and the other is nose picking. I'm afraid. I'm ashamed to say. Oh my God, I didn't think we'd go there. Okay. <laughs> Gross. 
I thought you were going to be like, well, you yeah, know, I'm too meticulous, you know, I'm too driven. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's my problem. Yeah, I'm a real perfectionist. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear. Wow. I'm amazed you went there. Yeah. I, I admit it. I'm a nice picker when I think I can get away with it. It's funny that we were recording in the studio uh, while I was uh, over in Seattle. And, um, uh, like, I thought I'd got away with it. But then afterwards, Al was like, oh, you've been picking your nose with that hand. I was like, how did you see? And, uh, well, that's been a mother for you. She can see from uh, the back of her head. So, yes, I'm a nose picker. What are you going to do? I definitely feel like, uh, and this is, I understand, not uncommon. I'm not special here. But um, that designer's curse of always wanting to change things is something that bugs the crap out of people around me where I'm like, oh, what if we moved this thing here or did that? Or, uh, you know, Karen will come home and I'll have moved something and she'll be like, what the fuck? Why is everything different? <laughs> Would you call that change for change's sake? No, because it always has a purpose and a reason. And it's like, oh, well, I, you know, I put this thing here so we could have that here. And now the hallway is bigger because we don't have this box here and this thing, or I stored this thing there. So it's closer to these things. Those like things are stored with like things now, or this color looks better over here because the color scheme on this side of the house is this. This would be a lot easier if you got rid of that big box of toothpaste, you know? <laughs> Honestly, we finally finished the toothpaste. Oh, no way. Yeah, they're gone. We got full-size toothpaste now. Welcome back to the real world. It's pretty great. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know where to start with my worst habit. Uh, I It's a toss-up between I bite my nails and I argue with people on the internet. I'm not sure which one of those is worse. And I can stop doing either one of those, but it seems I can't stop doing both of them. So I can I can go for periods where I resist the temptation to bite my fingernails and then they grow and I let them grow really long and then they snap and they hurt. Or I can continue biting my fingernails and stop arguing with people on the internet. I go, but I can only do one or the other. I suppose that exposes one of my bad habits then. I used to bite my fingernails, but then I was told that that's a surefire way to pick up um, colds and flu and everything. So I thought, ah, oh, let me try not doing that. So now instead I just kind of uh, bite at them with random sharp objects like bottle tops and just, you know, sometimes the end of an HDMI cable or whatever. What? <laughs> this is getting weird, man. I know. Oh, my God. I'm picturing you shoving HDMI cables up your nose now for some reason. <laughs> If you knew you could definitely get away with one crime, what would it be? It's super boring, but content piracy in general, I, I feel like you can get away with it. And it's one of those things where if I didn't feel like I had to, then I wouldn't. But because I want to watch that show, but I can't rent it from anywhere and... I can't afford to subscribe to every single service ever, then, you know, if I could pay 99 cents to watch that thing, I would do it, but I can't. And so, you know, sometimes you got to open up your Linux distro downloader and go grab that show. What, you mean you use torrents to download things other than ISOs? I didn't think that was possible. I was just saying, hypothetically, if you could get away with one crime. Ah, right. Right. Okay. Hypothetically. All right. It is irritating because it's it's one of those things where it's like, if it was easy for me to buy that thing, I'd love to just buy that thing. But yeah, it, it is super pedestrian and boring. Sorry. Why does the world owe you that TV program or album or film? It doesn't. It doesn't. What which like if I could if I could easily pay for it, I would. But they make it hard. They make it hard for me to pay for it. Right, but you don't have to watch it. That's true. There is plenty of other content out there. Even YouTube and stuff is good enough to stay entertained if you dig deep enough. What about you? What crime would you do? I would steal $300 million from Apple. I thought you'd go to a guitar shop and steal all the guitars. I'm really surprised. Well, no, if I had $300 million, I could just buy as many as I wanted. Yeah, but if you've already gone through the faff of stealing $300 million, why don't you just steal a bunch of guitars? Because if you've got away, if you're some criminal mastermind who can steal $300 million from the richest company on the planet, surely you can pill for a few guitars. Uh, probably, but we said one crime, and uh, that would buy me a sweet house as well, and a nice car, and a bunch of cool guitars. So, 
Yeah, quite boring as well. But uh, yeah, I think that they probably wouldn't miss three hundred million dollars, but that'd be enough to never ever work ever again and have just as much sweet stuff as I ever wanted to buy. If you could steal three hundred million dollars, why would you only steal three hundred million? That seems oddly specific and small. Because. I wouldn't really know what to do with more. And I think being a billionaire is just unethical, quite frankly. But 300 million is okay. That's ethical. Yeah. I think any more than that, and you want to be giving it away to charity, really, because you just literally don't need any more than that. Why don't you, Robin Hood, steal like 500 billion and then give most of it away? I could do, but I don't know. It it just seems like more likely to get away with stealing 300 million from Apple because they wouldn't miss it. Whereas 500 billion or whatever would just totally bankrupt them. So your question was one crime. Yeah. And the reason why I was asking you about the separation of the 300 billion and the guitars is because I, I wondered if you were classing theft in inverted commas as one crime. So if the, if the one crime that you could always get away with was theft, then you could steal guitars, steal 300 million, steal petrol from a petrol station, steal anything. That would be the one crime that you could get away with. Ah, right. That's a different way to interpret it. Yeah. I meant like one criminal act. So a serial killer kills many times, but they are a serial killer. The one crime that they got away with is they were a serial killer. I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm trying to stretch it because, <laughs> yeah. The darkest of us over here, how much can I get away with? <laughs> well, I want to know the parameters of this question before I answer it. I don't want to commit myself to something and then realize it was a terrible mistake. And actually, it was a different crime that I wanted to get away with. Um, so I, every so often, I'll have this thought experiment of what if I wanted to rob a bank? What would I do? And I thought about all of the the planning um, and uh, which cameras I would have to evade and, uh, where I would have to deposit clothing, uh, so I could get changed and where I would put cars so that I could get, you know, change from one vehicle to another and whether I would get other people involved. So I think, I think I like the idea having watched heist films. I like the idea of robbing a bank and I like the idea of getting away with it, but I like the idea of getting away with it because it's really well planned and executed. Not because you could just stroll in there and take it and nobody noticed, but I I, I want a, a really well executed heist and be able to get away with it and, you know, laugh all the way, well, not to the bank, but laugh all the way to a hole in the ground where I keep that money. So you're going into this with like, what's the crime I could have the most fun doing? Is that how you're answering this? Yeah, kind of. Bit of fun. Uh, and the intelligent execution that, that ensures that I don't get caught because I've done all the planning. Like whether it's um, like the Italian job where they, you know, they knock out the cameras and they cause traffic jams and they're able to get the gold bullion out of the city and, you know, that kind of meticulous planning or just the... Uh, the planning that, um, what's that film with, uh, Piers Brosnan that's a remake of another film, uh, where he steals an artwork or does he steal the artwork and then puts it back in the museum? The Thomas Crown Affair? Thomas Crown Affair, where it's all meticulously planned and he manages to fool the police and the insurance investigator. And, you know, there's a bit of seduction going on in there as well, but it's all so meticulously planned. It's something like that. And I don't know whether it would be a bank or a painting or whatever it would be, but I'd just, lo- I'd love to have, a really well executed robbery that steals from, like you said, a, a corporation that, you know, doesn't hurt anyone in particular. Obviously, they all hurt individual investors, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, no individual person is, you know, really put out, that kind of thing. There's a fatal flaw in your plan to rob a bank, and that is that banks don't really have that much money anymore because no one really uses cash, do they? I would imagine that banks, okay, they have a fair bit of money, but nowhere near as much as they once would. When I worked at the bank, I think we only held like $20,000 at a time. Yeah, exactly. It's not even really worth robbing that much, is it? Right, but you've said I'm going to get away with it. So it is worth it because I'm going to get away with 20 grand that I didn't have. Yeah, you could buy quite a few guitars for 20 grand. Mm. Mm. Maybe it would be worth it. I would be willing to change my answer and join your heist crew, but only if we do something way cooler like crash cars through skyscrapers in Dubai or something like really cool heist. Not like a bank, that's boring. What about Las Vegas? Casinos in Las Vegas. Let's steal money from all of the casinos in Las Vegas. How about that? 
at the same time. Yes. I think we've got the beginnings of a movie here, guys. Let's get right in it. Or a criminal investigation into two podcasters. (laughs) (laughs) 